you know, how do we survive this financial world that we're now finding ourselves in, this new economic world that I'm convinced has changed? Uh, the world as we know it and have known it, I don't believe is going to be the same. And if the society that emerges is going to be better rather than worse, it's going to be better because of courageous Christian witness. I don't doubt that those gathered here are Christians. I do have doubts, starting with doubts about myself, about how courageous we're going to be willing to be. Uh, I'm going to sketch an outline for you of what I see happening. But first, uh, I don't claim to have all the answers. I have, as, as Dave mentioned, there's, so much, there's such a treasury of wisdom in the church and so many smart people that you can consult a lot of that wisdom. And it really, uh, it, it's amazing how timeless it all is. Briefly, I'm going to let you know why I wrote the book that's out there. Uh, my brother and I grew up as, as kids. With my, you know, we would go out on weekends with my father, and we didn't go hunting and fishing. Uh, we went around and looked at real estate projects and uh, uh, business deals, and for a while he was in the used car business. And I mean, we, we kind of saw all this entrepreneurial activity, and that's how we grew up. And so we, we grew up thinking, well, what you want to do is you want to make money. And so we, we launched into it right away, and things went really well. And in 1995, we sold. Our, we, we started a firm in '89, and in '95, we sold it to a New York private equity firm, and boom, you know, we had this financial success kind of sooner than we had anticipated. So we're like the dog chasing the car, and then he catches the car, and then he says, "Oh, what, what do I do with this now?" And so, uh, you know, I, I I'm a truth seeker, and I started asking, what, "What am I supposed to do with this? Why why do we have money?" Whether a lot of money or a little bit of money, why do, why do we have it? And the more I searched, the more I realized, yeah, we're really not taught. And Dave, you were getting it, uh, 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 the things we don't teach our young people. We're really not taught the meaning of money. Some of us spend a lot of time learning how to make it. Uh, some of us spend a lot of time learning how to spend it. But hardly any of us spend time learning what it means to have it and thinking deeply about what we ought to do with it. So I talked to a lot of wise folks, I talked to a lot of priests, a few bishops, and what I found was that not many people had thought that systematically about it. Um, the priests that I would ask, you know, they, they don't have personal wealth themselves, they were hesitant, and they're hesitant to tell the lay people what we ought to do with our money because they, you know, they, they feel like they're having to beg for money at times anyway, and they're hesitant to sort of lecture us on that. Uh, and what I found is an incredible awkwardness about talking about money. And I realized, you know, it reminded me of how awkward we are about talking about sex. And when you think about it, one of the most, most uh, incredible accomplishments of Pope John Paul II was his development of, of, of what he called the theology of the body. You know, sex is a wonderful blessing. And so John Paul developed this beautiful theology where he said, we're going to talk about this, but talk about it in a principled, thoughtful, deliberate manner. It's not just something people do. It ought to be something they're deliberate about, that they're thoughtful about. And so I think in the same way, we need to have sort of a theology of business and a theology of money and wealth to really understand what we're engaged in. It's part of our corporal existence. And it's a blessing from God. So we don't want to ignore it because we're embarrassed to talk about it. For that matter, we're embarrassed these days. Dave mentioned existential questions. We're embarrassed to ask existential questions like, why are we here? How can I be happy? What ought I to do with my life? I think this purpose of life, what we ought to do with it, is related to a principle. In my book, I reference uh, something I call the principle of indispensability. And it's part of why I wrote the book. I think, it, first of all, when, in business, many of you may have heard the term, the graveyards are full of indispensable people. I used to hear that. I've used that phrase. I'm not proud of having used that phrase, but I used to use that. What does that mean, the graveyards are full of indispensable people? It means nobody's indispensable. Okay? You may think you're indispensable. The graveyard's full of indispensable people. And I realized how wrong it was. Each of us... I think each of us actually is indispensable. I think God put every one of us here for a reason. And I think part of our figuring out our purpose in life is to ask ourselves, what am I indispensable for? 
And you may think, ah, somebody else can do almost anything. Somebody else could be up here giving a talk. Somebody, but you know what? No one can be the husband to my wife that I can be. No one. There's not another person on the planet can be the same husband to her that I can be. No one can be the father to my daughter that I can be. There is no adequate substitute. If I were to die, there would be people my brother would help take care of her. You know, there would be people who chip in, but nobody can be the father to my daughter that I can be. And so I think as we go out in the business world, we need to be asking ourselves, what are we indispensable for? And, and seeking that as part of our motivation that Dave spoke to. I think at the end of our lives, we're going to get some version of the following question. You know all those blessings and opportunities I gave to you. What did you do with them? Did you use them to draw you and your loved ones closer to me? Because otherwise, I'm really disappointed. I think we're going to get some version of that. Now, I'm thrilled that upon the release of my book, Pope Benedict said to himself, hey, I think Hannah's on to something. We need to start talking about the economy. And he released it in a cyclical called Caritas in Veritatis. <laughs> We teach us about the modern economy. Um, obviously, I'm kidding about the Pope taking cues from me, but you know, I do think that it's incumbent upon the people in this room especially to understand the purpose we're engaged in every day out in the business world for, our, for the sake of our own souls, for the sake of the souls of the people we love, and for the sake of those who are influenced by our example. So as we're out there in the world, let's, let's pause and think for just a minute. Some of you have heard me ask this question before, but I want you to think to yourselves. How many of you, I don't need to see a show of hands, how many of you own slaves? We're in the Union League uh, uh, club, so th that, that helped put a, do away with that. How many of you own your own children? How many of you own your spouse? You know, spouses used to be regarded as chattel. Women were regarded as chattel. You kind of owned your spouse. But we don't think that way, I hope, today. How many of us, though, act as if we own our own lives? As if our own lives are chattel, personal property of ours, to do with as we please. The world tells us that our lives and our money are ours to do with as we please. As I progressed through my career, though, I sensed that that worldview might not be correct. And so I started studying wealth and its various manifestations. I started collecting data and observations about wealth. And I found that when we judge our lives, that our lives are ours alone to do with as we please, we're like the banker who gets so used to having the, the money in his bank in the vault that he starts thinking the money's his and doesn't belong to the guy that deposited it there. Now, when a banker starts thinking that that money in the vault belongs to him rather than you, the real owner of that money has some real problems. When you and I start thinking that simply and absolutely we own the blessings we have, then the poor and the needy have problems. And God gets irritated with us. So what would God have us do with these blessings we have? I think, this may sound simple, but it's good to remind ourselves of the simple truth. I think God wants us to use our lives to grow closer to him to help those we love grow closer to him, and to help others in their spiritual and corporal needs. Notably, in his encyclical that I referenced, the Holy Father notes that the market, and these are his words, is the economic institution that permits encounter between persons. Now, for those of us in business, that's a beautiful concept. The market is a good thing. It, it, it allows and permits encounter between human beings. I think the first vocation or calling of those of us in business is to be virtuous. Dave talked about virtue. That's our first vocation within business, is to be virtuous, to conduct ourselves in a virtuous way. When Pope Benedict came out with his encyclical, he specifically used the language of vocation in speaking of economic matters. But this first vocation of being virtuous is actually what we're supposed to do with any gift or blessing we have. Now, the second vocation of those in business is to create wealth. And that includes everyone here, not just the people who happen to work in Wall, on Wall Street or in the financial sector. Or, yeah, that includes everybody. We're all supposed to create wealth, which means creating something of value for others. 
You know what Pope Benedict said in his world message for peace on January 1st, 2009? This was not reported in the New York Times because it doesn't fit their, their mode of what the Pope ought to be saying. He said, wealth creation therefore becomes an inescapable duty which must be kept in mind if the fight against material poverty is to be effective in the long term. Wealth creation is an inescapable duty. And then the third vocation of those in business, giving, and giving some now. And that has to be in that ordered philanthropy that, that, that they spoke about. But giving some now, and I'll tell you why. Giving now helps those who can't afford to wait until tomorrow. Giving now helps form us in virtue. Giving now helps us to be happy. Now, why do I make that last claim? Well, one of my heroes, John Paul II, he wrote a wonderful essay encyclical called Veritatis Splendor. It means the splendor of truth. What a, what a beautiful phrase. Truth does indeed have splendor. Truth is the bottom line of philosophy. Truth can't be negated. It's there whether you acknowledge it or not. And if we continue truth and all the good things of the earth, they're gifts. None of us earns the truth. When we figure out how an engine works, or if we, we discover a new cancer drug, or we find out how to teach kids more effectively, we may have worked hard to find the truth, but the truth itself is a gift. I think that one of the transcendent realities of our world is that the entire economy of this world is an economy of the gift. Economy is the Greek word to mean how things are ordered, how physical resources are ordered. And I think it's an economy of the gift. None of us, think about this, none of us earned our birth, or our parents, or our intellects, or our sensitivities, or our talents, or our spouses, or our children, or the air we breathe, or the harmony we hear with our ears, or the sunsets we see. They're all gifts. I've worked really hard all my life, but all the best things in my life have been gifts. So if I'm right that this economy of the world is one of the gifts, it is one of being the gift, then the only method in which we can be fully human, fully what we're intended to be, is being consistent with this order within the universe. Dave talked about things being ordered. We have to be in consistent with the order of nature in the universe. In other words, giving a gift, philanthropy, love of others, that's what allows us to become what we're designed to be. Fully human. Fully human. And I think that's the only way we can truly be happy. The happiest people I know understand this, whether consciously or subconsciously, they get it. They understand that, that the economy of the gift is what governs the universe. Now, having said that, why is that hard for us to accept? I mean, it, okay, theoretically that sounds kind of nice. Why is that hard for us to accept? Well, I think whether we like it or not, we've all become materialist to one degree or another. I think the world is a constant battle between the transcendent view of reality and the material view of reality. And because of the culture in which we live and, what, and that surrounds us, the easier one to have as a default position is the materialist view of reality. Whether we like it or not, we live in an illusory world that denies the transcendent rather than make the sacrifices to understand it. Understanding transcendent reality requires sacrifice, and that's difficult for us. But I think the truth and reality is in this economy of the gift. Materialism says all that matters is matter. The Enlightenment came along and we feared if we can't sense it, touch it, taste it, feel it, then it doesn't exist. But in today's world, matter matters less and less. Intangibles matter more and more. Our current market crisis has a number of contributing factors, but one of the critical factors is that intangibles on a balance sheet, they've come to represent an increasing portion of the net worth of businesses. Intangibles. Intangibles are a lot harder to understand. Intangibles are a lot harder to understand than tangibles. We can't be silly and just say they're worthless. We know that a loan on a bank's balance sheet is usually worth something even if today it's not worth what the bank says it's worth, it's usually worth something. The problem is, though, that the asset, that, that asset, that loan on a bank's balance sheet, is intangible. And we have a hard time getting our hands around that. You really want to know what that asset is on a bank's balance sheet. When you see a loan on a bank's balance sheet that's an asset, you know what that is? That loan, that asset, is a representation of a relationship between human beings. That's what that asset is. 
You know the root of the word credit is credo, to believe. A loan is only an asset if there's a belief by both parties that the person who borrowed the money will pay it back to the person who lent it to them. Again, the loan is an expression of order, of human relations. And when that order between human beings becomes disordered, when the belief in human beings becomes disordered, the value of the credit instrument plummets or it vanishes. Now I'm an investor, and particularly in these times, I want to make sure I'm investing money wisely. If this non-materiality I'm talking about is indeed part of reality, if it's real, and if I'm going to invest in this modern world, changing as it is, and participate in the economy of the gift, what ought I to invest in? What ought we to invest in? This, by the way, is a recommendation I can guarantee you in this financial crisis will make you rich. So listen closely. I'm going to quote someone who gave us this investment hint a few years ago. At the time, he was Cardinal Ratzinger. He said this in the last homily he gave before he went into the conclave that elected him to be Pope. He said, of all the things on this earth, buildings, mountains, rivers, and art, of all the things on this earth, the only one that is eternal is the human soul. Think about that. If eternity exists, if it exists, then by far the greatest investment that can be made in reality is an investment in the human soul our own souls, and the souls of others. Now, I'm going to bore you with a business concept that many of you be familiar with already. You may know that if you extend the time frame over which you can receive a high rate of return, then the value of an investment goes through the roof. In other words, if one investment yields 15% a year for five years, and you have another investment that yields 15% a year for 100 years, well, the second investment is worth a whole lot more. The idea that you can get 15% a year for 100 years is far, far superior than the one that you get 15% a year for five years. Now imagine then if your return on investment, if your 15% a year goes into eternity. Imagine if your return on investment goes to eternity. That's what we're speaking about when we invest in the souls of others. So if we decide really to buy in and we want to make this investment, this investment of the greatest return, to what should we turn? You see, we all want our bellies filled, but beyond that, there's something else we crave. And I think what we really, really crave, spiritually, psychologically, even physically, is communion. We may not recognize it as this, but what we want, we want communion with God, and we want communion with each other. This is what our children also want. They want to be with us. I mean, that's what we see with our kids. They love being, being with us when they're little. I mean, then, then things change a little bit when they get older. <laughs> then they want to, to common union with others, you know. But we want common union with each other. We crave communion. And in fact, we can't live without it. You know, what we're all sharing here in this room right now, this is a communion. We're gathered here for a common purpose. We have a common union. We have communion, and since it's a good purpose that we have in common, this is a good communion. It's a communion that makes us happy. You know one reason it's so much more fun to go to a stadium and watch the game in person than watch it on TV? It's the communion you get. Think of the feeling you get when you get to, to stand up and be with 90,000 other people in common union on something. It's fabulous. Why in the world do, do a million people go down to Times Square on New Year's Eve in the cold and wet and snow and everything and the traffic and all the hassle? They want to share communion. It's something we physically, emotionally, and spiritually need. Now, why do I go on about this? Well, I think we need communion so badly. We crave it so badly and so desperately that we will feverishly seek to obtain it. And we're social animals. We need it to survive, and we'll do anything to get it. And here's what's interesting. Every human being will obtain communion. And it will either be a good communion or a bad one. We cannot avoid it. It, it, it would be like avoiding breathing. We form attachments because nature abhors a vacuum, and as social animals, we have to have communion to survive. And I say this because I think we, in this room, I think we can change the world by forming good and holy communions just like the one here today. It's that kind of communion that Lumen's all about. 
If man does not have good communion with that which is holy and true, he will have communion with that which is not holy and true. And that robs him, that robs us of our full humanity. Much of our secular world is composed of communions that rob us of our humanity. So as we come together in this forum to talk about our lives and business, let's think about how we can form in each, each place we happen to be, how we can form full and true communions with God and with one another, and how we might cultivate those communions among the people we love. That's what we're supposed to be doing in our everyday lives. That's why God gave us the gifts and responsibilities we have, to first be in communion with him and then with others through him. And we ought to use our everyday lives and jobs and money to do it. Oddly enough, we have money and jobs in order to grow closer to God. Now, speaking of money and jobs, where did they all go in the last two or three years? I, I wrote this book, you know, uh, What Your Money Means, and I'm working on the second one right now. It's taking a while to get it done, but I'm working on the second one, and that is, where did all the money go? That's what I want to have as the title of the book. Where did all the money go? What in the world happened here? May 19th of this year, the New York Times editorial page, tr the Treasury Department said, the U.S. has lost 17 trillion of wealth. 17 trillion of wealth. Globally, authorities say that 50 trillion has been lost. What about our retirement plans? It used to be the lack of birth control provided a different kind of retirement plan. Because people had more kids and their kids would take care of them. I'm serious, that, that was the idea, that was the retirement plan. Now, we hope someone else has the kids who will pay for our retirement plan. That's what's happening in Greece. Their, their birth rate just plummeted. And now they wonder how all the pensions are going to be paid off. No one wants to work at the most difficult task in life. What's the most difficult job in the world? Raising a child. It's really hard. So the idea is let's outsource that. Let's outsource that and somehow our pensions will get paid for. Maybe God's going to bring us around to realize that the money we thought was in our pensions is not there. The only thing we can count on is God and one another. Maybe we'll start to value children again as those who can take care of us later. And I don't mean you know, value children just for the economic engines they are, but let, maybe we start to understand the value of children. Maybe families will start living with one another again. I, I spoke with a couple last night who's here today. I won't embarrass them right now, but you know, and, the, and their kids and their parents are now living with them. I told him I, th I thought that was beautiful. It's a wonderful thing. We thought we could master our universe, but it's not our universe. So what are we going to believe in? We're like the Jews who worship the golden calf. Because the golden calf, why did they worship a golden calf? You know why? Because the golden calf put no demands on them. But I think the current financial mess is going to last a long time. I think it's a generational issue. How should we understand it? How can we grow wealthy? during this crisis, you know, in order to get wealthy, you have to first understand what in the world wealth is. Let's think about wealth. In fact, you know, I think as we develop a philosophy of wealth, philosophy coming from the two words love and wisdom, we need to love the wisdom about wealth. We need to have a philosophy of wealth. If you want to be wealthy, you should love the wisdom that teaches about wealth. So let's think of the word wealth. The word wealth comes from the Middle English word wheel, W-E-A-L meaning well-being. Our wealth is a function of our well-being. Unfortunately, well-being is hard to quantify. So instead, we use a very, very, very inaccurate proxy for wealth. We instead define wealth as economic net worth. That's not wealth. That's a real inaccurate proxy for it. Maybe before defining wealth, we, we, let's think about some individuals we think of as wealthy. Warren Buffett. Wealthy guy, right? Is Warren Buffett wealthy? I mean, do we know his well-being? We know he has an economic net worth. Who's wealthier, Warren Buffett or his kids or his grandkids? His grandkids have another 50 years to live. I guarantee you, if Warren Buffett found out tomorrow that he only has a week to live, well, he'd, pay, he'd pay $20 billion for another couple of years. What do we mean by net worth? Who's worth more? Think about this. Who's worth more, me or my daughter? She's 20 years old. Her balance sheet is probably negative right now, depending on what she's charged on her credit card, okay? So, 
And, and fortunately, my balance sheet's not negative. Mine's many multiples of what hers is. So who's worth more? Well, I'll tell you this. If you offered me a trade, and I have to give up my life for hers, like that, she's worth more than me. To me, she's worth far more than me. And so all of a sudden, you start to realize, you know, we, we, we always talk about what's he worth, what's she worth, not, you know, that kind of talk. And, and we fall into this trap of defining wealth and well-being in these economic terms. You know, Rockefeller didn't have air conditioning. He didn't have whole foods where you can eat fresh vegetables from all over the world. I mean, I have greater, greater uh, eating. I eat a lot better than Rockefeller ate. Yeah, did he have greater wealth, greater well-being? Is an orphan child who stands to inherit a billion dollars but never knew their parents wealthy? Are children who go through painful divorce wealthy? Charles Murray, who writes for the American Enterprise Institute, many of you may have read some of his books, he's writing a new one right now about the, in, in the uh, white blue-collar community, uh, uh, the amount of family breakdown and illegitimacy and divorce, it's just, it's just epidemic at this point. Is that the sign of a wealthy society? In the New York Times Magazine in May, they had a fascinating article about GDP. Is it really the best measurement of wealth? Now, the Europeans have looked at this, Sarkozy and the French have looked at, you know, is GDP a good measurement of wealth? And it's easy to pass it off, no offense, as, oh, those are those, uh, you know, French socialists and what do they know? But it's a good question to ask. Is GDP the way we measure wealth? I don't think, obviously, I don't think it should be. I think we have to think of wealth in a different way. And in order to think of wealth in a different way, and I want to sort of close with this, um, I'm going to read you a paragraph from one of PIMCO's reports, um, who I shouldn't be reading from PIMCO because there's a far better money manager represented here in this, in this room uh, uh, with Federated. So I, I forgot about that when I, when I had this quote from PIMCO, but anyway. Uh, on the future of investing, they said, whether evolution or revolution, it is important to recognize that the aftermath of an economic and investment bubble transitioning from levering to delevering, globalization to deglobalization, and lax regulation to re-regulation leads to an across-the-board risk, I'm sorry, rise in risk premiums, higher volatility, and therefore lower asset prices for majority of asset classes. The journey to a new stasis is a destructive one insofar as it affects previously assumed wealth. Rough estimates suggest that as much as 40% of global wealth has been destroyed since the beginning of this delevering process. In essence, asset prices, which are only, listen to this, asset prices, which are only the discounted future value of wealth creation go down. Not only because that wealth creation slows down, but because it's become more uncertain. In such an environment, equity interest in the form of stocks, real estate, or even high yield bonds become re-rated. Now, that sounds kind of technical, but what, the way I'm going to translate it is that one of the critical points is that material wealth that they're talking about, they talk about prospects for the future material wealth, our wealth, is inherently a function of hope. And hope is an expectation of the future. I want to suggest that as a definition of wealth, that wealth is a measure of our well-being most accurately measured in the quality of the human capital and the relationships we possess and the expectations of those relationships. We don't actually need money to be wealthy. Is Buffett wealthy? Like I said, if he found out he had a, a week to live, he's not so wealthy. In fact, here's what's interesting. Buffett worth $50 billion right now, a day after he dies, in the world's eyes, he's worthless. Wow. He's worth 50 billion, then he's worthless. Think about that. That's, that's the material view of things. And this is hard to accept because we've become materialists. As Christians, though, we shouldn't be judging wealth by the amount of material goods. We've also become individualist. If any of you have seen Cardinal George's book, um, it's, it's, it's really uh, quite a wonderful piece. And, and he says in the U.S., we worship the individual. You know, and we do. I, I want you to know, when I went on a marriage retreat recently, my wife and I, and the priest said, your main job as a spouse is to get your spouse to heaven. And it, it hit me like a ton of bricks because I thought, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
marriage is supposed to be something that somehow benefits me. Um, you know, and, and he's completely defining it and what I do for her. And it was, like a, it was like a revolution. I don't mean to sound so selfish, although I am selfish, but I went into marriage thinking, what will this do for me? All of us have our checklist. You know, we think, okay, I meet this person, I'm, you know, do they have this, do they this, is this, you know, and, and we, we have our checklist. When in actuality, you know what we ought to be doing? When we get married, it ought to be a situation where we're saying, how do I fit this person's checklist? Am I the right person for them? If you really love someone, it's other-directed. But we grow up in a culture where we focus on ourselves in an individual way. And so this rugged individualism, it can easily lead to selfishness and ends up destroying our wealth. Because if wealth is part of relationships, it destroys our wealth, it destroys our trust in one another. In this global crisis, credit crisis, when we extend belief in others, if my extension of credit to someone else is evidence of a human relationship, if I don't have hope in the other person and in this human relationship, the relationship won't prosper. And it's the same with marriage. We have hopeful expectations of the future of the relationship. But when the hope dries up, there's this spiral, vicious cycle of relationship dysfunction. And that's why so much wealth has been lost. I mean, there are all kinds of technical reasons with the Fed and with this and that. But the fact is, when the hope in, in human relationships starts to dry up, it's a dysfunctional, vicious cycle. And so I, in the present, how can we be well and have well-being when we think of wealth as something that's a future prospect? Well, other than human souls, which are the only thing that is essentially good, when I say essentially, I mean good in its essence, Everything else is of value only in relation to its potential in the future. You know, gold on a desert island is worth less than bananas. Things are only valuable in terms of, of, of the future. So we have to invest in that which has value in its essence. That's the bedrock of true wealth. As Pope Benedict says, wealth creation depends on faith in the human person. We have to invest in souls. We gotta invest in our own souls through the virtue that Dave talked about, and we've got to invest in the souls of others. And we, we are responsible for cultivating the virtue of hope. Hope is a virtue. It's not just an attitude. It's a virtue. It's something we work at. When we invest in soul, our souls and the souls of others and we cultivate the virtue of hope, that's when we'll bring about happiness. Have any of you ever read uh, uh, Viktor Frankl? He was a, a Jew who survived a concentration camp. And he wrote a wonderful book called Man's Search for Meaning that many of you may be familiar with. And one of the things he points out is the people who were able to hold on in that concentration camp were people who were hopeful, who cultivated this virtue of hope. And the way they did that was in investing in other relationships. Let's face it, what, did you, what do you have in a concentration camp? You've got nothing. You may not even have a shirt on your back. You've got nothing other than your will and your decision to invest in the other people and to help the other people. The folks who made it through that, the, the concentration camp, he was a psychologist, and he wrote about these, these common themes. And the ones who made it through were the ones who invested in hope and in human relationships. They understood that was the greatest source of wealth. And in fact, these people walked out of that concentration camp with wealth. That's true wealth when you survive a concentration camp. Hope is indeed the essential ingredient of all true wealth. That's what I want to leave you with. It's the essential ingredient of all true wealth. And for that matter, much of the material expectation of the world has that as its, as its source of wealth. But hope as a virtue requires work and sacrifice. Government can't provide it. Government should cultivate it. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But the audacity is the notion that hope, a virtue, can be given out by the government. Government can't create hope. I think our path to wealth is in our coming brave new world is to cultivate the virtue of hope for ourselves, our spouses, our children, our communities. We want to invest in human souls and the relationships in those souls and learn to create value for others starting with those we love. Earlier I asked, where did all the money go? I'll end by saying the money didn't really go anywhere. As a society, we've been destroying our wealth, our well-being. And each of us in this room can turn that around. Each of us in our orbits that, in, in, in which we're involved can invest our energy in cultivating hope, the root of all real wealth, and investing in the human relationships we have with others. And let's continue to ask ourselves, not what is my net worth. Let's ask, what is the state of mine and my family's well-being 
their emotional, their spiritual well-being. What's the state of that? And am I adding value to that? Because if I'm adding value to that, I'm creating wealth. In our communities of faith, we're called a witness to the rest of the world. People will be watching you. People will, it, and I think things may get worse. People will be watching you and how you act. How do you live? What do you value? What do I value? Are we better parents, spouses, sons, and daughters, and employees? Do people know us like the early Romans knew the Christians? If any of y'all ever heard of a guy named Rodney Stark, he's a, a sociology professor, writes in Baylor, and he wrote a book called The Rise of Christianity. And what he said was, when the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, and everybody thinks it was Constantine sending down an edict saying we're now officially Christian. No. Constantine merely put down an edict that recognized what had already happened in Rome. What had already happened in Rome is it had already converted. And the reason it converted was people watched the witness of the Christians. They saw they lived differently. They didn't have, everybody didn't have New Testament. They didn't have online capability to, to, to study all this. They watched the witness of Christian people and they converted the most powerful empire in the world. If we want our society to be better, it's because people are going to see what we value, how we act, our Christian witness. It converted the Roman Empire, and it can convert the United States of America and the globe today. And the opportunity is there for us. If we want to be happy and wealthy, we cling to the transcendent rather than the material. We seek to develop virtue and become holy. We seek to develop holy communions with one another. And we invest in our own souls and the souls of others. If we do that, we will be wealthy, and our witness will be a beautiful star to the rest of the world.